tell us a little bit about you know who you are, what you do, how you got <laughs> here, and, and uh, what the company does, and uh, we'll get started. Great, Matt. Thank you. Hey guys, I'm Adam Brown. I'm executive strategist at Salesforce. I have been with Salesforce almost exactly a year. The 15th is my one-year anniversary. Uh, before this, I led social media at Dell for about three and a half years, and before that. Uh, created and led the social media organization at the Coca-Cola company for, uh, for about four years. Uh, I sit in the uh, exact target marketing cloud division of Salesforce, so focused on our social media listening plays, which is our Radiant 6 tool, our uh, publishing tool, which uh, was, is called Buddy Media, at least for a few more days. We've got some uh, announcements next week. Uh, our social.com media buy and play, and then our, our most recent acquisition of exact target, which plays in the email and mobile uh, organization realm. Hey everybody, Chris Kearns, uh, Director of Analytics and Research at Spreadfast, uh, right here in Austin. Um, until a few weeks ago, I was the Director of Analytics and Research at Mass Relevance. Um, but as you may have heard, uh, we merged with Spreadfast, um, I think literally just like four or five weeks ago. So I'm still getting the company pitch down, um, so forgive me. Uh, but uh, it, it was actually something that, I mean, not only were, were both companies right here in Austin, both in the leaders in the social space, very exciting for everybody. Uh, but when we looked at the products uh, and, and the client makeup, it just made a ton of sense. Now what we've got combined um, is um, a social journey uh, that marketers can go on from everything from discovery to customer relationship management uh, to curation and display on any device, anywhere, or any screen. Um, and uh, we're real excited about it, and our clients are real, really, really excited about it as well. Um, my role, uh, I head up everything analytics and, and research, so that, that does everything from seeing how our products perform and, and uh, setting expectations with our clients, uh, as well as uh, thought leadership and analysis of social data, looking at everything from um, uh, posting patterns to text analysis and, and uh, natural language processing to geolocation analysis, anything that we can get out of social data that's interesting um, that you guys should be excited about uh, is, is my job. Gary Benmark, good afternoon everybody. I'm with McKinsey & Company, the uh, consultancy, New York based. I run a team that's called McKinsey Social, which is part of McKinsey Digital. We serve clients across all customer facing industries on issues of uh, the application of digital technologies to sales, marketing, customer service and service operations, new product development and innovation. We typically serve the, uh, the CMOs of Fortune 500 companies and that's where social fits within the, uh, the, broader, the broader kind of uh, digital framework. If you're wondering about the accent, I'm originally from the startup nation of Israel, but I'm here legally. <laughs> <laughs> I know people are wondering. Yeah. Uh, and, and a little bit about me. Uh, so uh, before Marin, uh, I got my start in online marketing, running eBay's online marketing group for, for a number of years where we actually built our own technology stack across these channels. Uh, we spent a lot of money. Uh, we did some, we served some funny search ads, if you guys remember those days. Uh, and then after that, I, I moved on to Google. Uh, so spent uh, some time on the dark side in, uh, in Mountain View, as, as we used to refer to it sometimes at eBay. Uh, and then now I'm at Marin where, where I drive product strategy, corporate development, and marketing. And Marin is, a, is basically a cross-channel SaaS platform for managing spend across search, social, and display. So let's, let's jump into, let's start this panel with a, with a discussion on, uh, before we get to social ROI, let's talk about ROI in general. Uh, and why don't we, we start with Gaddy, move back, you know, talk about some of you know, as I, as I look back to my days at eBay, right, we jumped in with, you know, feet first and we understood the concept of lifetime value and we're constantly optimizing to that. Didn't really have a good handle on attribution back then, but, but I felt when it came to understanding ROI, we did a decent job. Tell me about what you guys are seeing in the marketplace and how folks, you know, how, how they look at ROI and the R in ROI specifically. Sure. So at the end of the day, it, it all ties back to the key business metrics at the CEO, CMO level, right? And as we heard this morning, what, what matters at the end of the day is things like sales or cost of service or cost of customer acquisition. And everything else cascades, cascades down from, from, those, uh, from those metrics to be 
to be meaningful. The good news is that in, in recent years, as we've seen again this morning, there is a plethora of new technologies that allow uh, uh, our clients to be able to, to track those things and measure them, measure them online, as well as make the connection, as we saw this morning, make, make the connection to, uh, to offline purchases. And that replaces the, the need to apply, you know, what we call to apply religion to, to the questions, right? That guesswork with strong beliefs, it, it can be, uh, be data-based. It also make it a lot easier in companies that used to work traditionally with media mix modeling approaches, because right now you, you're able to actually track it at the, at the individual customer level. You know, what were the exposures and therefore, uh, what were the exposures and what were the, uh, the actions taken and, and, and look, at, uh, look at correlations at, at that level. So I think this is probably you know, where, 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 things, uh, where, where things are headed. Um, time to business goals and being able to, at the very granular level, make, uh, make connections that until recently were not, uh, were not possible. Do you think people, though, have a, have a good understanding of, of the value of that particular business goal? So one of the things that we see is a lot of times people just optimize towards the transaction value. Right, oh, that, that purchase was worth $100. And you know what though, right? Should they be optimizing more towards the lifetime value? And how do they think about you know, downstream unit economics in terms of, well, if this user is worth $1,000 to me over their lifetime, you know, how much should I put towards the acquisition channel versus maybe some of the, the social stuff that I may do to retain them and so forth? And, you know, where, do you think, where do you think clients, where do you think marketers are in, in that type of understanding? Do you have a sense for that? I, th I think, um, without a doubt, customers ha are sitting on such a, a huge pile of data, but it's sitting in disparate net systems and disparate networks right now. And I think there's a there's a question certainly around correlation and causation. There's a question uh, in and around, you know, as you said, lifetime value and, and and what that ROI is. Is is the ROI actual sales? Is it improvement of brand lift? Is it shareholder value? Or is it cost avoidance? I mean, actually making, seeing that marketing activity now be more efficient. I mean, if we can all remember Marketing 101 class, we learned about John Wanamaker. He was kind of considered the pioneer of, of, of retail and marketing, who is often attributed with a quote, I know I waste half my advertising, I just don't know which half. You know, that was, I think, quote was in like 1903, here we are over 100 years later, and we're still kind of wrestling with that. And what we're trying to do, at least at Salesforce, is, is say, okay, let's, let's find a home room for all this data so then we can kind of bring, inhale all that data and then exhale something that's actually actionable. And what do you see, what do you see from the measurement side of things? Sure. So, yeah, um, so I'm coming at this at, at, from a, a very different angle um, from more on the, on the organic side. Yeah. So there are a few paid hook-ins that, that our tool has. Well, I, I used to run uh, SEO at eBay, and I used to say that freedom is not free. So, you know, or, you know <laughs> organic is not free. I mean, there's a cost to organic, right? A absolutely, absolutely. But uh, running an organic social campaign or, or, or having a conversation, non-paid conversation uh, with, uh, with your audience um, through social channels, um, that's a lot of the research that, that, uh, that I have focused on. Um, and I think it's... Um, it's very different from all the sessions I saw this morning, um, for sure. Um, yeah, what, what you guys do is really hard. It's awesome. Uh, but you know, th those, those, per those uh, scenarios that you guys are playing with, with the multi attribute, it, it's amazing stuff. You guys are doing very good work. Um, but from, from the organic side, it's, um, uh, I think the problem has been for traditional ROI, um, I, I completely agree. There, there's buckets to ROI. There's, there's direct revenue. And if you design a organic, non-paid social campaign correctly from the ground up, you can take some of the benefits of social around sharing and engagement and get real good revenue off of it. Mm -hmm. But just posting, how's everyone doing this morning, is not going to drive that, right? Uh, that might be part of a larger social strategy, organically, but it's not going to drive necessarily revenue that's, that you can uh, attribute right back to social. And that's okay. Uh, it, fr from my perspective, that's okay. There, there's cost avoidance, there's all sorts of things. But I, I think ROI and social has always been the issue that uh, people get up and talk in panels about at conferences for years now is because um, it, the, on the organic side, it is a mix of art and science. Um, and that's okay too. It's a conversation and it should be a conversation. If I'm designing an algorithm to create uh, Twitter, uh, uh, to, to create tweets, that I think will engage my audience uh, based on real-time trending, I'm gonna fail 
because I'm not gonna have a good voice around that. I'm not gonna give them a sense of my brand and my culture, which is what a lot of brands are trying to do with organic social. Um, there, there's a f uh, you know, we have worked with clients to design specific campaigns to say, this is gonna make money, and we're gonna, we're gonna put uh, barriers around, it's gonna be social only, it's gonna be for 48 hours, it's gonna be a flash sale, uh, you have to tweet 50,000 times to get, to open the door up, we call it flock to unlock, and then people swarm in and they buy it and we can say it, all this revenue obviously came from social. That's very targeted. Uh, there's power in having it be limited, but there's also, a, you know, there's a miss. You miss the, the rest of the, um, uh, the market, that's okay. It's designed to, to create a short-term revenue, but every day you're not gonna be doing that for most brands. The only brand I've seen do that uh, uh, every day is Amazon. Amazon has um, a Twitter feed set up where every day they will tweet out a deal of the day. And that's all they do. And that's fine, that works for their brand. Um, but that's not gonna work for a Kate Spade or a Pringles or whoever might be out there. They're more interested in getting people to understand the culture of their company. Yeah. yeah. I, that's, I think Chris brings up something so, so interesting, because you're right, Amazon is one of those few brands that can make the content about the deal. Yeah. And people are receptive yeah. to it. But you know, almost every other brand, if all you're sending out are those deals and those transaction-based messages, that's essentially social spam. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna turn right. it off. So while there may not be an ROI on asking, to, to Chris's point, hey, how's everybody doing today? You have to do some of those kind of more conversational, earned and owned activities so that you kind of get that permission and you get the edge rank and all the other analytical sides. Yeah. So when you do have that deal, your, 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 your recipient is responsive and, and willing to, to participate. I think uh, we see the, the creation of engaging content as the, the, probably the toughest nut that, that folks in this space are, are dealing with because it's, it's, uh, it, it's very difficult to buy engaging content, right? You can buy fans, so you, you can buy reach, right? right? But to be able to get engagement going on an ongoing basis, especially on the, uh, on the earned side of things, that's very difficult, right? And unless, it in essence makes companies across many industries de facto publishers, they need to come up with you know, some kind of an editorial calendar and they need to come up with ideas for good content. And there needs to be a process to vet this content to make sure that it's compliant, if, especially if we're talking about regulatory industries. And it has to match what you know about the customers, so that it's engaging. And then there has to be a, a creative element in it, right? It's not all the science. You, you have to be able to put something out there that people will, number one, see value in, and number two, will want to share. Because you know, once they, they see value for themselves and they want to share, then that's what uh, kind of quote unquote rings the cash register when it comes to, uh, to engagement. And that's very tough to do. Um, one approach that we've seen people take to help facilitate this is to understand through, social media, through very deep social media listening, what are the needs of my audience groups, right? So everybody who is following me on various social media venues, you know, Facebook and and Twitter and, and, and Pinterest and people that read my blogs and people that read you know, other blogs in my industry, what can I say about them in terms of segmentation, right? What kind of segments do they fall into just based on the, the, the patterns that, that they exhibit in social media? And what kind of needs do they express, right? Because these are two-way channels. You, you get a lot of value by following what people are posting and then trying to synthesize from that organically what are issues of, what are, what are areas of uh, uh, concern? What are needs for information that these people express? What are their passions? What are their pain points? And, and then use those insights to drive your content creation strategy. When you do that, there is a higher chance that your content will be engaging content, right? And you'll be, uh, you'll be able to, uh, to hit the spot with, with, with high value content. Got, got to hit it. I mean, I, I call it purposeful edutainment. The content you create's got to be educational. Um, it's got to be entertaining, though, or it won't get to the next step. But it's got to have a purpose. And the purpose doesn't mean it always has to have a call to action in it, but it, maybe it's leading to another message that has a, a call to action. And, and, and when Chris said art and science, you know, my, my ears perked up because I think that's something that we have to continue to, uh, to remember. You know, when, you're, when you're looking at listening, like Gotti mentioned, and you're seeing what people are saying about your brand, and you look at the, the posts that you're sending out, you have to kind of figure out why those posts work or didn't. Did it work because it was an 80-character post instead of a 120-character post? Because we all hear 80 characters is a sweet spot. 
Was it because you put it on Tuesday and not Wednesday? Was it because it was just one hell of a good post? It, it told a good story. But you, that's where that art and science kind of has to be parsed so you can kind of learn and then you know, lather, rinse, repeat. So, you know, ju jumping to one of, the, one of the things that pops up, you know, like I, said, I got my start in search and you know, now looking at, at social. You know, in a way, Facebook seems to, and I don't know if Twitter's going to get there. You know, if you think about Google 10 years ago, eight years ago, and you look at their, their search results page, right? A lot of organic, very little paid. Right? You look at it today, and it's basically 85% paid media, right? And sometimes 100%. You know, on mobile, it's, you know, above the full 100%. You know, we, you guys have been talking a lot about organic social. Is, 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 is Facebook heading down that same route? Are they crowding out? Organic, um, you know, what, what, what's your view on that? Where do you think that? Where do you think that ends up, and, and, and what happens there? Anyone? <laughs> I, I think I, I think so. I mean, I think you know the edge rank challenge has has, has, has continued to be there, and it's understandable. Facebook mm -hmm. is public. Facebook. I know we've got some some from folks from Facebook in the in the room today. Um, that, that, that's accepted. Um, but it does change the pay, paid, earned, owned, and shared kind of model that, that we use to kind of go back to ROI. If you're a yeah. CMO, first you've got to look at media mix. Okay, how much am I going to give social versus search versus traditional? Yep. But then once you even get into social, okay, how am I going to parse that between paid, earned, and owned, and, and, and shared? And certainly, I think Twitter is kind of following in, in, the, in the footsteps. Um, you know, the question I think is still out whether the value that we're, you know, we're paying for those paid inclusions yep. on a platform like place, Facebook are as valuable or, you know, kind of to rationalize the extra cost that, that paying for that paid placement is indeed, you know, take, hitting our bottom line. Yeah, we, have, we typically advise clients exactly on that last point when they're kind of putting together their social media strategy to first take a, a completely open and wide scan of their target customer base and get their digital footprint across all of digital. And it varies a lot by industry. In, in, in retail, consumer electronics, there's a lot of activity on, on Facebook. But once you get into verticals such as financial services, retail banking, mortgages, credit cards, insurance, or uh, things in healthcare, especially around pharma, hospitals, uh, uh, medical devices, the, the conversation, the bulk of the conversation is not on Facebook for a couple of reasons. First of all, these are topics that people don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about under their true identities. And they prefer to be on you know, blogs and boards and forums and discussion groups where they don't need to disclose their true identity. And second, these are not necessarily issues that people are comfortable discussing with their friends. You know, if somebody's suffering from a medical condition or has uh, uh, issues around you know, foreclosure on their, on their home, they'd rather discuss it with, with people that they think are subject matter experts as opposed to friends. So when we serve clients in those verticals, we start with, this, with these scans, and then we oftentimes discover that, hey, your social media strategy should have perhaps an element of Facebook and Twitter, but it's certainly not the lion's share in those cases. And if you're focusing all of your uh, media buying, all of your uh, uh, campaign attention and energy on Facebook and Twitter, you're you really uh, uh, leaving a lot of value. You're really missing, uh, you're really missing an opportunity to, uh, to connect with your targeted audiences where, where they are. So let's um, you know, take a break from me asking some questions. Uh, why don't we, do folks in the, uh, in the audience uh, have, a, have a question or two? Shock and awe. Right, shock and awe, nothing right now. Well, I'll, I'll add something to, to, to what, what Gadi was saying. Um, I think another way to look at it is, 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 is listening, because I think you're so right. Social is more than just Facebook and, and, and Twitter and Instagram and YQ and, and all, all the YB, those, those, those platforms like that. Uh, oftentimes when we go in and we're starting to talk about social listening, um, you know, people kind of get a false sense of security thinking they know everything that's being said about their brands or their competitors if they're, if they're looking at those too. And, you know, with, at least with our, with our listening tool, Radiant 6, there's one billion sources that it's tracking. You know, you know, you take Facebook and Twitter out, we're still at 999,999,998. Million, and, and especially if you're in, you know, a vertical like finance or a regulated industry, especially if you're in a kind of a longer tail where it's, you know, automotive or gaming or technology where there's a lot of people talking about your stuff, you need to be knowing about those um, 
environments and then you need to participate. And you know, and the kind of the philosophy is listen, engage, act. Listen to what people are saying, engage in those conversations, and fundamentally begin to act upon that. Whether acting is actually changing your marketing or getting larger than marketing and actually fundamentally changing the culture of your company based upon what your customers are saying. And, and when, you, when you guys look at measuring the effectiveness of that, do you see that, you know, we saw that chart earlier today in the Axiom presentation about you know, the assist ratio of various channels. Do you, you, know, you talked earlier though about the, the direct bottom of the funnel impact that social can have. Where do you see most of those, when you think about measuring it, do you look for that direct impact or are you, you looking for some of those upper funnel assist uh, type of uh, you know, valuations, if you will? For, for us, it's both. It, yeah. it depends on the strategy and you know, kind of going back to the original, um, the original big question about social ROI and what does that mean. Um, having a goal, goals-based approach is how you gotta go about it, but I think the step that people usually miss with, especially with social, it's still relatively new, I don't know, a decade or so, um, is that they tend to put it off in a silo. You've already got goals as a company, right? Why should you reinvent them for a new channel? Yep. Your, your social should be supporting the goals that you already have that everyone's already signed off on. Uh, it should be a part of every other goal that's happening, every other strategy that's happening. Um, and so, uh, if, if we're gonna, if we're looking for a, a bump in direct revenue, we're gonna create a campaign around that. Work with a client to create a campaign. If we're looking to optimize a landing page or a product page, we can use social to show a good amount of conversation happening there and, and bump conversion rates up as well. Um, and then we can also increase engagement. Uh, you can um, have more one-on-one -on -one contact, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or on a forum or on Reddit or wherever it might be, uh, any of the social channels that are out there. It all just depends on what you're trying to, to achieve. And you can do all of those at the same time, too. Yeah, we've got questions. Okay. Craig Shirk from DirecTV. Uh, questions more about social in general, not ROI specific. What do you um, think companies should be doing in social that, that they're not doing today? Like, what's the one biggest area of opportunity that everyone should be doing that they're not doing? I think, I think for me, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it starts with, with listening. I still think there's most companies are not doing an effective job of, of listening. And then it's like, what do you do with that? Are they just listening to, to kind of do share a voice and sentiment and things like that? And that's important, but within any company, you've got parts of the organization that may not sit in marketing who can actually have a, a voice. You know, they're subject matter experts. And how do you empower the subject matter experts who one day may be answering the phone and talking to customers or prospects or, 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 or um, you know, partners or determined detractors? How do you get them better involved to, uh, to participate in those conversations? I still think outside of maybe a little social media organization, inside of a marketing organization, there's not a whole lot of people in both Fortune 500 companies as well as small companies that are actually recognizing that people are talking about them. It's, I think that's a, that's a very valid point. The, there is an organizational barrier that we see in many situations that, that causes that, whereby the, the listening is owned by market research or by a, a, some kind of a consumer insight group, research folks, uh, folks that typically buy you know, products from, uh, from, from Nielsen and the Nielsens of the world. And then you have a social community manager, a social community management team within marketing whose goal is to engage with customers. And the, the, the two are in two separate organizations and, and they're, they're run tactically under very different sets of, sets of, sets of metrics. They're also uh, a budget from, you know, from, two, uh, from two different buckets. And it creates this, uh, this missed opportunity, this, uh, this uh, disconnect. Because if, if you marry the, uh, the research with the social media engagement, that's an opportunity to create a lot of value, right? Um, if you're thinking about, you're asking about missed opportunities in social. We, we, we tend to look at all of the digital touch points with customers and prospective customers along a journey, a customer decision journey, a CDJ. And we start by understanding, okay, if, if you look at the, at the customer journey for your, for your brands, for your products, starting from uh, awareness through consideration, through moment of purchase, and then ending with, with loyalty and, and bonding, where do you see the most drop-offs relative to competitors or relative to where you think you want to be, right? And if the most drop-offs are in awareness, that dictates a very different social media uh, reach and engagement approach mm -hmm. than if the drop-offs are primarily in consideration. Right? Do you have an issue around discovery and awareness issue, and therefore you should have social media programs that drive discovery, 
or do you have issue around consideration, meaning people are aware of your brand, but they don't think highly of your brand, or there's something preventing them from moving forward in the along the journey with your brand towards, <coughs> towards the moment of purchase, that calls for a different set of, of strategies and tactics in social media uh, outreach and engagement. And likewise, if you have issues uh, further down the journey post-purchase with a low incident of, of repeat purchases, right, if you find yourselves if you find yourself invariably spending this proportionate amount of money on new customer acquisition as opposed to getting repeat, uh, repeat business from, from people that you already acquired once, then you know that you want to think about targeting your, your social media strategies and, and tactics at the, the bonding loyalty uh, stage of the uh, state of the journey. I think an opportunity that we see in many cases is, is the, lack of this kind of, uh, the lack of this kind of thinking. I'd, I'd like to answer too. Um, I, I think it's, um, I, I agree uh, with, with everybody, but I, I also, the first thing that popped in my mind is experimentation. Um, I think that uh, not only kind of micro experimentation with figuring out which hashtags, which, um, which posting times, which language, should I use an exclamation point, should I use a smiley face, or do people freak out? Like that's all f great stuff to be able to test uh, and easily you can test that, but, but experiment with new channels. Um, uh, Audi wasn't afraid during the Super Bowl this year to uh, open up a Snapchat account uh, and start sending out completely nonsensical, awesome snaps during the Super Bowl that kept people talking about them on other social channels as, w as well as, as on Snapchat. And I think the key uh, to that is uh, that cost them like zero dollars, right? It, it, uh, you, you get a creative to, to build out a couple comps and, and you're done and then you post it and you check it out and if it doesn't work, okay. Um, I think the key to that is with your exec depending on how complex your organization is and, and the culture within your organization, it's about getting that sign off from the exec executive sponsor, not on a project by project basis. And this has kind of been a theme uh, throughout the presentations today. It should be a program, not a project. Um, and so to, to have a program where you can experiment, you need to set guardrails instead of asking for permission each time. You say, okay, well, what's inbounds and what's out of bounds? Anything in here. Uh, and we've got legal sign-off, and we've got copy, and we've got design, and, and, and the brand, and everyone, everyone agrees that anything in here is okay. So you don't have to go back every time and ask permission. That sucks. Yeah, one of the things, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit from the paid side. One of the things we see that, that people have undervalued is, is we see actually a huge impact uh, on search from social. So if you can get people to you know, engage you know, from a social standpoint, and then you see them in search or vice versa, right? the, the, the revenue per customer, the, 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 the number of items they add to the shop just goes way up. Right? And so this, this whole concept of, you know, I'm reacting a little bit to the chart before, this whole concept of social acting as an upper funnel thing or an upper funnel activity that drives some of the lower funnel uh, other activities is, is, is very relevant and very true. And if you start to look at it from that type of an assist standpoint, you know, going back to the ROI, just even on the paid side, we start to see the ROIs really, really pay off. I, mean, that, that can, I, I couldn't agree more. This, the, the connection of search and social is so critical from just link love, from you know, obviously uh, search engines are looking at the, con the public content on Facebook, public content on, on, on Twitter, and actually using that to, mm -hmm. to rank. And secondly, you know, when, when, I was, uh, when, when I was at Dell, one of the things that, that we did was actually use our social media listening assets to improve our, our, SE, our SEM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, SEM was our biggest digital marketing expenditure, and, and I think sometimes we recognize we were buying words like technologist, you know, sitting inside of a technology company. You know, we were calling it an ultra book, but yeah. our consumers were still calling it a thin laptop. Yeah. So once we kind of began to realize that our customers were talking about us using those words in social media, we started then buy those keywords, and we saw you know, almost immediate improvement in efficacy of SEM. And checking internal search helps as well. If you're checking Absolutely. the internal search box on Dell.com, I'm assuming you would get to know the, the jargon and the language and, and what's, uh, what, how people are talking about your products as well. Yeah. So I mean, that's, that's just one of those other mind. silos that isn't talking to the other side. Right, right. right. Absolutely. So I think uh, with that, uh, we are going to cut it off. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for your participation. And um, you know, let's enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>